The Odyssey, an original adaptation written and retold for you by John Buckeridge. Chapter 9 The Dead There was a special kind of silence in the Great Hall at Phaeacia. The kind of silence that happens when someone has said something so outlandish, so outrageous, that everyone in earshot is trying to convince themselves they couldn't possibly be what they meant and work out what the real meaning was instead. A journey to Hades and back, asked King Alcinous. Surely you mean... I mean, surely you mean... Well, what do you mean, man? Odysseus smiled, despite himself. Sometimes it was nice to remind himself that the last few years were not normal, that normal people didn't have to face the things that he had. He imagined what his life would be like if it had been more normal. I'd probably not have quite such good stories, he thought, but I'd probably be a lot happier too. He took a breath and remembered. Odysseus and the Ithacans stayed in Circe's house for several months. Eventually, though, the threads of home began tugging at their hearts, and they began making attempts to return to Ithaca. But however many times they tried, they never succeeded. The problem is, said Eurylochus as they discussed it at Circe's table, some gods got it in for you, sir. Every time we try and sail in the direction of home, we get caught up by some monstrous storm, and we end up on a more monstrous island than the one we were on before. Uh, no offence meant, Mistress Circe. You have a lovely home, he finished, suddenly remembering where he was. None taken, replied the nymph. After all, I did try to turn you into pigs. Eurylica shuddered at the memory, but pressed on regardless. Anyway, sir... You need to find out who you've upset and what we can do to sort it out. You're probably right, Odysseus sighed, but how do we find that out? It's not like we have a direct messenger service to the gods, do we? Unless, his eyes fell on Circe, you have access to Olympus. Can you find out who's got it in for us? The nymph held her hands up in front of her. Whoa, whoa, she said. I'm a lesser goddess. I can't just turn up on Olympus whenever I like, only when I'm summoned. Besides, it's not like we sit there discussing who's got a grudge against what mortal when we are there. Some gods take offence so easily that conversation could go on for a long time. They lulled into a silence as they considered the issue. Then Circe piped up again. Of course, she said in a tentative tone, there is a mortal you could ask who might know, the blind prophet Tiresias. If anyone would know, Tiresias will. Tiresias is dead, said Odysseus glibly. That's going to make asking a little bit tricky. He'd mentally dismissed the idea and turned his mind on to the next one when Circe spoke again in a small, quiet voice. There is a way, she said. There was a long silence, and eventually Odysseus asked, What do you mean? Circe looked around the room. She shifted from foot to foot and took a halting breath. Understand, she said, this is not a thing often spoken of. To my knowledge, no mortal has ever done it. But it is possible to sail by night to the forests of Persephone, Queen of the Dead. There, if you leave a blood offering, then the dead may come through the veil to meet with you. There was another silence while they took that in. Tell us everything we need to know, said Odysseus, a determined edge entering his voice. So Circe told them all she could, and that night the Ithacans set out to sail to the land of the dead. They were sailing in completely the opposite direction of Ithaca, and it seemed that was enough to make the god whose anger they'd roused leave them be. Circe brought up a calm wind to see them on their way and guide them on their course by moonlight. In time, they came to a place where even the stars refused to shine, and a low mist rolled across the surface of the water. Then land loomed out of the fog towards them, and following along it, they found the mouth of the river Styx, the river of the dead. Rowing upstream by torchlight, they could see very little of the landscape around them, but what they could see was strange. They had been told these were the forests of Persephone, but they looked more like the memory of trees than trees themselves. They seemed warped and distorted somehow, like they were seeing them in a cracked and dirty mirror. 
where a normal forest is usually filled with noise and energy and life, this place was cold and quiet and completely still. The only sound they heard was their own breathing and their oars cutting through the jet-black waters of the river Styx. Eventually, a sound did come out to meet them as they heard a mighty waterfall. Rounding a bend in the river, they saw it before them as it thundered down from above. This is the place Circe told us about, said Odysseus, and they tied their ships to the banks of the river Styx. I don't like it here, said Pyramides in a low voice. It's the land of the dead, Pyramides, said Odysseus. You're not supposed to like it. The men huddled tightly, holding torches and looking into every shadow as Odysseus dug a deep trench beside the waterfall. He brought out three rams and sacrificed them using their blood to fill the trench. And then they waited. For a long time nothing happened, and the eerie silence of the forest of Persephone surrounded them. But after a moment, there was movement. At first it looked like nothing more than the spray from the waterfall, but then part of the mist kept coming forward. It lunged and stretched towards them until it became a human form, thin, insubstantial, but human. Then another came, and another, and another, all pale, misty echoes of living people. Odysseus had heard that spirits were white, and that they glowed, but these were an icy blue-green colour, and they certainly didn't glow, rather they seemed to suck in the light around them, greedy for any source of life. I really don't like this place, said Pyramides, his tone quavering. Odysseus couldn't disagree. Seeing the trench filled with blood, the spirits crowded towards it, but Odysseus was ready for this. Circe had warned them that Tiresias must be the first to drink. Drawing his sword, Odysseus stepped in front of the trench. He doubted if his blade could have done any harm to the spirits, dead as they were, but they seemed to remember the idea of the blade and shrank back away from it. At that moment, though, Odysseus recognized one of the spirits and the blade fell from his hand. Pacing towards him, though her feet left no mark on the ground, was a face he knew well. Mother? he gasped, hardly daring to believe his eyes. My darling son, the shade replied. The voice was hers, but it was thin and stretched somehow, and echoed like it came from a great distance away. I didn't know you were dead, said Odysseus numbly. You were alive when I left Ithaca. The words came out almost like an accusation, but he couldn't think why. Oh, son, that was a decade and more ago, replied his mother gently. A lot can change in that time. Her eyes looked sadly at him as they roamed his face. He knew the years had taken their toll on him as well. Is father, is he, with you? Odysseus asked hesitantly. Your father still lives, though he does not live well. He grieves for you, Odysseus. Go home to him. Go home to Penelope, his mother urged. You should see Telemachus now. He's the image of his father. I'm trying, mother. I really am. Odysseus felt tears running freely down his face, and unable to hold back, he lunged forward to embrace his mother, but there was nothing there. He tried again and again and again but she only smiled at him sadly. Odysseus! came a warning shout, and Odysseus looked round to see the spirits reaching for the blood once more. Taking up his sword, he ran back in front of them and they backed away. Odysseus stood there a while longer, holding back the ghost of his family, ghost of his friends, ghost of his fallen comrades from Troy, until finally the crowd of spirits parted and one strode forward. It was a tall, willowy figure that walked with a stick that seemed every bit as ghostly as they were. They were clearly blind, but Odysseus got the feeling that didn't stop them from seeing everything. It was Tiresias at last. The spirit stopped, put a graceful hand into the trench of blood and drank from it. There was a moment of silence where all the spirit's eyes were trained on the ghostly figure, who was musing over the blood as if it were fine wine. It nodded and a grin passed over Tiresias' face. As if given permission, the spirits lunged forward to drink as Tiresias stepped forward to Odysseus. My, my, my Ithacan, Ithacan, said the shade, in the same echoing voice his mother had. You are in a spot of bother, aren't you? Can you help me? asked Odysseus. Of course, said Tiresias. After all, After all you came you such came a long, such a way, long to way to see me. To see me. Odysseus breathed a sigh of relief, finally some answers that may help. 
Which god have I angered? Odysseus asked. And how did I do it? The Cyclopes are the sons of blue-haired Poseidon, the earth shaker himself, said the shade of Tiresias. You stuck a spike in the eye of one of them, and they have precious little eyes to spare. And he called down curses on you, which Daddy Dear is making good on. Apparently, you are never to set foot on your home of Ithaca again, or if you do, you must be unknown and alone. Odysseus's heart sank. He was the king of Ithaca, so there was no way he would be unknown on his island. And how would he possibly get there on his own? He couldn't sail a ship alone. So you're saying... There's no way we can get home. The will of one god, however powerful, is never absolute. There is one way, but I don't fancy your chances. There is a stretch of ocean so perilous that even Poseidon himself pays no attention to it. On one side there are the wandering rocks, which no ship save the Argo has ever made it through. On the other side, there is a narrow channel between two cliffs. On the left-hand side of the cliffs lives the many-headed monster, Scylla. She trails her heads down on long necks and snatches men from their ships to eat slowly and brutally. On the right-hand side is the beast Charybdis. She was once beautiful, but thanks to your friend Circe, she is now a foul beast, surrounded by a sucking vortex in the ocean, gulping down ships and spitting out their remains with no survivors. That doesn't sound great, said Odysseus. No, agreed Tiresias. If you want my advice, you'll stick to the left and choose Skiller over Charybdis. At least that way you'll only lose some of your men and not all of them. Well, can we not fight them? asked Odysseus. But the ghost of Tiresias smiled sadly at him. Ah, there's the soldier in you. Never willing to accept defeat without a fight. These are gods, though, Ithacan. They are not yours to fight. You could do no more harm to them than a fly could to a boulder. Well, I can see why Poseidon doesn't pay much attention to this stretch of the ocean, said Odysseus glibly. This sounds impossible. I have not finished yet, said Tiresias, a manic glint in the ghostly eye. Before you even reach this channel, you have to pass by the island of the Sirens. These creatures lure in sailors with their songs, and when their ships break on the razor rocks that surround their island, the sirens feast. No man has ever heard their song and resisted the urge to go to them. Oh good, replied Odysseus, his heart sinking further. Anything else? As it happens, yes, said Tiresias. Should you make it past the Sirens and through the Deadly Pass, the first island you come to is Thrinacia, the island of the sun god Helios. He keeps the most marvellous cows there, fat and juicy and delicious, but if you should eat even one of them, then anyone whose mouth has touched that meat will not live to see another summer. Well, that one sounds all right, replied Odysseus. We just won't stop off at that island and we'll push on till the next. Tiresias gave him a sad smile. You can try that. that. Yes, yeah, said the seer. So, let me get this straight, said Odysseus, counting on his fingers. We have to make it past the deadly siren song, which no mortal has ever survived. Then we have to go through the narrow channel with not one but two fatal goddesses with a penchant for human flesh. And if we manage all of that, we have to avoid the temptation to eat a cow, or we'll bring down the wrath of a whole new god upon us, which would be a stroke of irony, considering we were only there to avoid the wrath of the old god who's angry with us already. Have I got that right? Tiresias gave a grin, ghostly eyes twinkling. I did tell you I didn't fancy your chances. Understand, Odysseus, it's no easy thing to overcome the will of a god, and you'll need the favour of a god to achieve it. Fortunately, I think you may have some assistance in that regard. So I keep hearing, said Odysseus with a wry grin. I don't suppose you'll tell me who it is, will you? Tiresias returned his grin, but shook their head. They talked a while longer, but eventually, with no cue Odysseus could see, the shades and spirits seemed to feel that their time was done, and drifted back through the roaring water. As they left, Odysseus searched out his mother, and he kept his eyes on her until the last. We reboarded the ship, Odysseus told the silent hall in Phaeacia, and sailed back down the river towards the mortal plain. I don't think we truly felt ourselves again until we felt the soft fingers of dawn greet us and finally heard sounds of life around our ship. The Phaeacians were rapt, all silent and staring. No one moved, no one blinked, 
Queen Ariti had a cushion tightly clutched in front of her, half covering her mouth. And what? Alcinous began and cleared his throat. <clears throat> what route did you take through the pass? And how did you avoid hearing the siren's song? Odysseus gave a small smile. The events were horrific, yes, the memories were painful, yes, but he was also a storyteller, and he knew how to leave his audience wanting just a little bit more. He waited just a few more heartbeats and replied, Why, my lord, I didn't avoid their song at all. <laughs> <laughs>